Well, welcome. Um, first of all, and many of the folks in this community are, are well aware of, of who you are and, and you know, and, and at least one of your books. I know you've written several books. And uh, um, But if you wouldn't mind, could you kind of go through your background a little bit, share us a little bit about your story, and then we can kind of get into some questions. And then the folks will be able to ask questions through the chat, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll relay those as appropriately. So anyway, if you if you don't mind, give us a little little five minutes summary if you can. Sure. So I uh, became a vegan when I was 16 years old and I did that um, in the way that most people do it which is that I met another teenager who was a vegan and I was convinced uh, her whole family were vegans and they were really into it and within two weeks of talking to her I that's it I'm just going to be a vegan and I mean it's very convincing material right like if you do this one thing can save your health, save the planet, save animals, um, make all this food available for starving people in Africa or India or wherever, and you'll fix everything. All you have to do is stop eating animal products. And it seemed true. In the other thing, of course, that is that is very convincing is the horrible pictures of factory farming. And no matter what anybody decides to eat, I think we can all agree that that is just utterly horrifying. So on top of that were, of course, the horrible pictures. So it just seemed like the right thing to do. And I was, even as a, a young kid, I was somebody who was very um, concerned about issues of justice and compassion. And I felt very deeply the destruction of our planet. And I was trying to figure out why are we doing this and how do we stop it and how can I help? So all of this sort of you know, led me to be a very fertile ground for this ideology of veganism, and I took it up with a vengeance. So I did it for 20 years. Um, I did permanent damage to my body. There's no way you can do it that long and not end up with damage is really the take home message. So it was a long, hard 20 years because I'm also somebody who's, you know, remains intellectually curious, and I never stopped trying to answer those questions about why were we destroying the earth and what I could do about it. And the problem was I kept bumping into the question of agriculture and the pattern called civilization, which is based on agriculture. Any, any real historical knowledge will take you back to that, that, that that is where the damage begins. But I couldn't face that as a vegan as I thought that I was doing the good thing, the right thing, the thing that was gonna fix it all. And then you realize actually that's the problem so there was 20 years of this sort of terrible back and forth inside my mind of, I, I want to engage with this information and, and keep asking these questions. And I can't because I've embraced an ideology that won't let me. Um, and it's definitely an insight for me into the nature of the fundamentalist mind, um, how you can just stack up all this counter information. But if you've already sealed up all possibility because you think you're right, you're never going to get to it. So that was a real push-pull for 20 years. You know, like I, I say, I wrestled with that angel, and I did. And then I would put it down. It was like, I, I can't actually absorb this because it means I'm wrong about being vegan. So it took me way longer to get out of this than it probably would have for other people um, because I was so just ideologically hell-bent and just, you know, just completely sealed off in that, in that sort of vegan echo chamber. And eventually my health failed to the point where I had to face it. I, I can't do this anymore. And that was a very hard day. That first day when you step out of it, um, you don't know who you are anymore. That's, I think, one of the real problems with veganism as it's constructed is that it becomes your identity. So it's never, it's never just, oh, I eat this way. It's who I am. So all that information, you know, it's a threat to your very sense of self. And that's, you know, one of the, the hardest things to get out of, you know, when you're in that world. Um, and I mean, I've heard this story a million times from other people, you know, who have been through the same thing where they know their health is failing, they're in constant pain, they've got, you know, problems X, Y, Z, A, B, C, all of which I had, um, and you start to realize it's diet. And then there's this massive struggle inside you. How am I going to get out of this? And the other problem is that, you know, you're going to lose a great number of your friends. So there's this cult-like element, you know, where you can't just change your mind about something and still be friends with people. 
you're now on the side of evil and they have to purge you from the community. So that's quite real. And if those are some of your best friends and that's your sense of community, you are going to lose it all. There's almost no one who will come along with you. So that's a hard thing too. Um, anyway, that, <laughs> that was, you know, the background to it. Um, and I also, after that, I, you know, I did start to re-engage with all the information that I had, all of the kind of on the ground, hands-on stuff. I had, you know, tried to have a garden. I had done all this stuff. And, you know, every time, every single avenue led to veganism does not work. Um, so eventually I was able to like start reabsorbing all of this and, and, you know, really trying to think it through and do more research. And well, that matches what I've actually tried. And yeah, you're right. The garden failed until I added manure, like all of this. Um, and then I got really tired of having the same conversation with people, um, people who were still in, in that vegan world and clearly were having health problems. And I would try to walk them through, look, this is what I know now. This is what I know about why it's not going to work for you nutritionally. Also, why it's the most destructive thing we're doing to the planet. So on every level, what you've been told, none of it's true. The impulses are the best I mean, those are the values we're going to need to get to the world that we want. So compassion and justice and caring for the voiceless and environmental sustainability, like that's so core to who I am. And, and we need those values. That's not the issue. The issue is how best do we institute them? And the vegan program is completely wrong on, on all of it. So I got very tired of trying to walk people through this one by one by one, because it takes an hour and a half, two hours to like, you know, sort of explain you know starting okay what is agriculture why is it so wrong what is it done to our our you know to human society what is it done to human health like all of this um you know and then their heads would be sort of spinning and i'm like yeah i know and i'll give you some good books um but at the end of it i was like i'm so tired of having this conversation i've been having this conversation now for two years three years five years i think i just need to write a book and then i can say look here's the book you can take it or leave it there's lots of footnotes like start on your own sort of journey down this information, but I can't just do it, keep doing this one-on-one. -on -one. It's, it's pointless. It, it needs to be bigger. And of course there are people hitting this from every angle. And a lot of us are recovering vegans, recovering vegetarians, but there's so many good people now out there, so many good organizations that are really trying to fill, you know, the, the culture with way better information about what's gone wrong. How can we fix it before it's too late? global warming, sequestering carbon in soil, you know, all the health aspects of it. Like it's totally different than when I was 16 years old. There's so much good information out there now and people on the ground doing it, you know, and you, you can go see it, you can try it yourself. Like there's, there's really good stuff out there now. So to the extent that I may have participated in a little bit of that, I feel really grateful that at least um, I got to do something with this like horrendously awful story of what I did to myself you know, if it helps somebody else sort of get out of that world and in, into a better place, then then it's all good. So that's why I wrote the book. You know, um, while probably only a small percentage of people really consider how their diet impacts, you know, the the, the environment, uh, you know, the planet's health, you know, the people that do, you can certainly still, well, I mean, I would argue that you definitely can be a meat eater and care about the environment and and help to implement and improve and i have people i interview people all the time from the sort of regenerative agricultural side and we see what they're doing and you know like i said there what you talk about agriculture first particularly tilling the land uh has been very very destructive and you know you can go around to any beach or ocean and you know i mean there's more it's more than you know, we see the plastics and all the, the garbage that's everywhere i mean it's you know we clearly are having an impact on the planet one way or the other and i think it's just the, the, the you know the other thing you know when you say i was a 16 year old girl and and we do see that with veganism it is it seems like that is the target demographic for the most part and it is very much an appeal to the emotional side and it's very you know when you you know when you show up some you show some animal in some horrific situation all of us are going to say that's unacceptable and, and you know even most people that participate in animal agriculture will say that's unacceptable uh, and you know it depends on you know where you're at you know i think you know i think there's very much difference between chick chickens and pigs and cows and sheep and there's you know different ways these animals are treated you know regardless and then there's different degrees of factory farming i suppose you could say but 
Um, let me ask you, so you wrote a book and it was called The Vegetarian Myth. Why did you title it that and not The Vegan Myth? I'm just kind of curious about that because you were a vegan. Right. What, what, was it, what, was it, what was the thought of saying what's a vegetarian myth, not the vegan myth? Well, two things. One is that there's way more vegetarians than there are just vegans, and I wanted to reach them as well. Uh, and number two, it's the same problem, um, that you think you're doing the right thing for the planet and for the animals and for your health, and you're not. And it, it takes longer if you're a vegetarian for your health to really collapse, but it, it's going to happen. So, you know, I, I wanted to reach those people as well because it's, it's the, the same idea. It's the same problems with the diet itself. And, and you kind of alluded to the fact that you, you developed some kind of long-term health issues, <laughs> you know, eventually. Can you just, well, well, if you don't mind, what, what, what sort of things were you, were you dealing with that made you decide, I just can't do this anymore? So some of it got better and that, you know, yay, the body is, 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 has some resilience in it. Um, but the first thing that happened to me was that I uh, started and I ended up with really bad blood sugar issues where I was clearly going through the sort of, you know, the insulin rise and then the crash and then the rise and then the crash. And every year that got worse. But I would say even two, three months into it, I was already starting to experience that. And I never had before. And I didn't know what it was. I mean, I didn't even have a language to describe what was happening. It was just, I knew that if I didn't put food in my mouth now, I felt like I was dying. Um, and I was. I mean, it's a biological emergency. When your blood sugar is either too low or too high, um, you know, our brains can only survive within a really narrow range, which shows we were never meant to be, you know, eating a plant-based diet. We, it's a very, very blunt mechanism. When, you know, for it to, to stabilize that insulin. I mean, we clearly were meant to eat, be eating some essentially ketogenic diets because our bodies handle that really well. With insulin, no, we, we don't. I mean, sugar would have been, you know, once in a while a treat. And, you know, even people say, oh, there's fruit. Yeah, there, there was fruit and there still is fruit. But every fruit that we have uh, domesticated, we've taken out a lot of the bittering agents and we've added probably 100 times more sugar than they were anything our ancestors would have come across in nature would never have been that sweet. So it's just, you know, we're just not built for it. So I, I was experiencing that like almost immediately after taking up this diet and you can call it com complex carbohydrate if it you know makes you happy. The sad truth is at the end of the day, every single one of those quote complex carbohydrates is broken down into a simple sugar in your guts. That's how it gets through the brush border and into your bloodstream. Your body does that. So it doesn't really matter whether you're eating, you know, groovy brown rice as opposed to evil white refined whatever. It ends up sugar in your bloodstream. And I was somebody who was an incredibly strict, like whole kind of vegan. I would not eat anything that had white flour in it. I didn't eat white sugar for 20 years. Like, never touched it. It had to be super pure whole grain. It didn't matter. Like, you know, within two three months of eating that way, I was already on that horrible blood sugar roller coaster. So that was problem number one. And, you know, it took me 20 years to figure out that that had a name. It's a real problem. And the only way out of it is to eat a ketogenic diet. So that was a problem. And I pretty well destroyed my insulin receptors. I mean, I was probably two weeks away from being honestly diabetic because I just blew through them. So that was problem number one. I stopped menstruating almost right away. Um, that's, again, a, a, a known side effect of these diets in women. Um, the other people, of course, who get it are women who be generally really low fat diets. Um, and of course, athletes, it can be a real problem for female athletes who are trying to get their body fat really low. You don't have enough for basic biological female processes. Um, and the body is really interesting, you know, like we have all these sort of fallback plans to keep you alive. And all of the hormones in your body are made from cholesterol. That's the mother hormone. Okay, and that, a lot of people don't know that because cholesterol has been so vilified over the last 30, 40 years, but it's an incredibly life-giving substance. So if you're not eating any, if you're hardly getting any, um, your liver does make a lot as well, but you do need to eat some. It just, you can't make enough to really fill the role that it plays. It's like every single cell in your body is surrounded by cholesterol. Like if you think about a balloon, if your cell is a balloon, the membrane of every cell is like the outside of that balloon, and that's made from cholesterol. It gives you your structural stability. If you could, you know, push a button, snap your fingers, and remove all the cholesterol from your body, you'd be a puddle on the floor because you'd have no 
structural stability at all, because that's what holds every single cell together. Um, without cholesterol, you can't do that. So, you know, you're going to have all these problems. So one thing your body does is if you're not eating enough cholesterol to provide for all these functions, your body starts to sh sort of shut off some pathways and keep it, keep the cholesterol going toward what you really need to stay alive now. The moment to moment, you know, can we keep ourselves alive? And what that means is the cholesterol that normally would go to produce your sex hormones, they stop producing them. Your body just says, we don't need that right now. You're in no shape to have a body, to have a baby. We understand that. You're clearly starving. So we're not going to make any sex hormones. We can deal with that in a few months when there's food again. Whatever your trouble is, it'll get better. In the meantime, we're just going to keep you alive. You don't have any sex hormones. Um, this is true for men as well as women who go vegan. It's, it's just more obvious for women. So I stopped menstruating pretty much six months into it. Nobody could tell me why. You know, doctors really aren't trained in this kind of thing. The answer is so obvious now, but... That went on for 20 years where it's just almost never got my period. It was completely random. It was like nine months, 12 months, seven months, two years. Like who knows when it's happening again. Um, and it was just seems so random. And they're like, well, you can go on birth control, go on birth control pills. It's just crazy. So I, I didn't do it, but it wasn't until all of this, you know, sort of collapsed on me and I had to find better information that it was like, well, that is such a simple answer to this. And then of course, you know, just comparing notes with all the other vegans was like, yeah, that's been happening to me. Yes, yes, I had that problem too. And so you end up with all these troubles reproductively. And the only good thing is I can say is that I never actually wanted to have a baby. So it didn't bring a lot of grief into my life. But if I had been someone that wanted to be a mother, it would have been horrible. Like, why can't I have a baby? Like, you know, people suffer so much with that kind of thing when they have fertility issues. It, it would have been really awful. So, I mean, I'm sort of glad that that I decided I was doing other things, but I know that that would have been a source of tremendous grief because by the time I figured it out, it was pretty much too late. Um, so there, that's another problem is, is you're going to mess with your sex hormones. So you're not going to have a sex drive. Um, you're not going to, you're going to just wreck your fertility. There's going to be long-term effects on your reproductive organs Soy comes in here too because of the phytoestrogens. And of course, if you're a vegan, you tend to eat a lot of soy. So those were the two things that really go, went ahead and just destroyed it for me. My sister was also a long-term vegan. I think she did it for 12 years. She ended up with endometriosis from it, the soy especially. Had to have a hysterectomy. Um, just so many years of suffering with that. Um, for me, when I stopped being a vegan, and then very soon after that, I took all the... I, I came upon all that information about soy and there's sort of that slow trickle of horror down the back of your neck. You're like, what have I done to myself? And I, so I took all the soy out of my diet and two weeks later I got my period and I didn't miss another one until menopause. So in my case, it could not have been more dramatic. Like, Oh yeah, it was the vegan diet, especially the soy. It's just, there's no question. So yeah, uh, you'll, you'll wreck that part of your life. Um, and then two years into it, I started to get really bizarre and uh, intractable pain in the lower part of my spine. And, you know, you go around to various doctors and you try to figure it out. And I was way too young to have the problem that I have. But turns out I have uh, the discs in my spine were degenerating. And that's absolutely nutritional. It, your spine's not supposed to fall apart when you're 18 years old. Maybe when you're 80, you should have those problems, but not when you're 18. So now when doctors look at my MRI and, you know, the medical records, I mean, their first question is, oh, were you in a massive car accident or did you have a skydiving accident or did you fall off a roof? Because this is really insane. How did you do this to yourself? I'm like, well, I'll tell you what I think, because yes, two years into this crazy diet, um, I got this constant horrible pain in my lower back and that never goes away. Once you wreck your joints, they don't really come back. Uh, joints are very poorly vascularized and there's a level of damage past which it's just not going to get better. So I am in opioid level pain for the rest of my life. I have a lot of um, constraints on my physical activity. It did get better a little bit when I stopped being a vegan. Um, it took some time. It took three, four years, uh, but eventually the pain level um, did dramatically decrease. So by the time I was done being a vegan, I mean, the, it was so bad. I could only sit up for about 20 minutes at a time. So, I mean, my life was really small, um, and then I had to lie down for a while. Um, so that was my life, when I was sitting up for 20 minutes, half an hour, and then lying down for half an hour. It was just the best. So I couldn't go to the movies. I couldn't travel. 
friends came over. Everybody was used to me having to lie down all the time. And now it's like, I still can't stand up for very long, but um, I mean, I can sit for hours at a time and I, the, the pain is just so much decreased. And that really is just getting enough saturated fat um, and taking out all those inflammatory compounds that come with eating a vegan diet. It's, it's nothing but inflammation. It's all omega-6s. And that just wrecks havoc throughout the whole body. So taking all of those out, being really careful to eat only very good quality uh, meat and dairy products, all the omega-3s, that takes time. Uh, that's kind of a slow flywheel, but it did work to some extent. It's like, it's never going to repair completely, but I'll take what I have over what, you know, what the end of that was like. So that was another pretty bad one. And I hear from vegans all the time that have these kinds of problems. And the same thing, they're in their early 20s. They've wrecked their knees, their ankles, their hips. Everything hurts. Like you can barely move. You know, some of them have my exact condition. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. There's, you get on a better diet you're still young enough, you might get it back, but you know, it may be permanent. It joints are tough. You know, once they go, they're gone. So I did that. Um, I had, I mean, some of this was fairly minor, but when you live with it every day, so my skin was so dry, it hurt, especially in the winter, it was terrible. And it would just crack and bleed. It would keep me up at night. I mean, it itched so bad. It was so dry. And I'm going to say day three of eating eggs again, I, I, I woke up in a completely new suit. It was like, what the hell? I can bend my arms and move my legs and it doesn't hurt. Like, what have I been living with all this time? Like, you don't even realize what you've done until it's over. And my whole complexion changed. I kept running to the mirror, just sort of staring at myself. Like, I look like I'm alive. Like, I had no idea, like the gray pallor that I just looked deathly all the time. Now I can recognize that in other people. Like, oh, this poor thing is clearly a vegan. But, you know, I didn't know because it just seemed normal. So anyway, that and the eggs, man, eggs are good foods. So that just completely cured all those problems. Um, and then, you know, you have all the, um, oh God, that sort of emotional mental realm where you have the brain fog, depression, the anxiety, there's just no bounce in your brain. So if, for instance, I couldn't find my house keys uh, within five minutes, I'm not exaggerating. I'd be lying on the floor crying. I just, I couldn't handle it. Like, where are my keys? I have no idea. I can't find them. Everything sucks. I should just die it's over. Um, it's, it's not like that. That's not normal. Like if you're feeling that bad, you need help and some help may be nutritional. And in my case, that's what it was. And I can, you know, walk you through sort of everything that's wrong with veganism in terms of brain health, but you're not getting a single thing you need to have a brain that will actually function. This is true in the medical research. Like we know what happens to people's brains when they go vegan they shrink 5%. Like that's one twentieth of your brain is just gone after a few years of doing this. Everything that you need to, to make the neurotransmitters and the famous one being serotonin. We all know that, you know, what that does for depression and for having a, you know, a happy mood. Um, all of those amino acids come from protein and then the receptors themselves are made from essentially animal fat. They're, they're made from, you have to have fat. Your brain is like 80% fat just by weight. Without it, you just, you're just you not going to have the neurotransmitter and you're not going to have the receptor. There's no way for your synapses to move. You're just, that's it. You're killing your brain. And, you know, this brain, it's like, it's an amazing thing. It took millions of years to create our brain. Like, that, this is what humans have. We have giant brains. Um, and 25% of your energy moment to moment just goes to feed your brain. Like, that's how intensive this organ is. And just by eating the wrong thing. You can just bit by bit erode it. So yeah, that, that was another thing that just immediately evaporated from my life was just th that horrible, you know, the mental instability and the constant depression and anxiety that never made any sense. And well, it doesn't make any sense. It's an internal state. It's got nothing to do with the outside world. So, and those are things that, that will respond very, very quickly. Um, do nutritional repair, like often within a few hours. I mean, I've, I've seen this sort of miraculous uh, transformation and just before my very eyes with, you know, various friends and colleagues. I'm like, let me just give you some advice. Let's try this. And you can even, you know, have some amino acids to go with it for a few weeks and see it. And honestly, within two or three hours, sometimes people are just light up like they haven't been for years. And it's your, your brain absorbs it pretty quickly. So that repair happens pretty fast. Um, so I would say that was sort of the main, the main problems that, that, that I 
bumped up against being a vegan. And these are all kind of bog standard. Like all of them make sense now. I understand what happened. I can walk anybody through like why this is going to happen to you. And it's just, there's, it's, it's pointless. Like it's pointless suffering. It didn't help anything. It didn't help animals. It didn't help the earth. It didn't help starving people. It was all for nothing. Yeah, I mean, you wrote, you wrote your book, I guess it was 2009 when it came out, so 11 years ago. And, and, you know, today we see, you know, thanks to social media, and social media has a lot of good and, and a lot of negative to it. But we see, you know, very often these people that are sort of, in, I guess, high-profile vegans say, I just can't do it anymore, I got too sick. And we see this, this repeated over and over again. And many times they are not res- – that – sort of admission is not received well within the vegan community and i know you got particularly early on and i don't know if you hesitated to publish the book because of maybe i don't know if you anticipated the backlash that you got you were (laughs) you were not you didn't make a lot of vegan fans for yourself when you did that and i think you were even physically accosted or physically attacked by this so can you kind of yeah. Can you can you describe like when this came out and how you were how the how that was how that was received among the vegan and non-vegan communities? Um, so right away, it's you know it's immediately polarizing. So everybody they either love you or they hate you, and the vegans mostly, of course, hate me. And the people who were into traditional nutrition and um, you know soil repair and you know regenerative farming, all, the, those people were like, "This is the book we needed." And that made me really happy. That is like, this is going to be useful in some very, very important um, public discussions that we need to have about the state of our planet and all of this. So that part was good. Um, Of course, it's really hard when people hate you and they go online and tell lies about you and there's nothing you can do about it and it's all anonymous and you just have to learn the hard way. Never read the comments because it'll just suck your soul dry. Like, just don't even do it. So I, I do have a few friends who help me sometimes and you know, they do things like check my Amazon reviews for me and just let me know if there's something that I need to know about. Um, but I don't ever have to do it. So anybody out there, if you're doing anything that's even really controversial, don't ever read the comments. Just, just You don't need to learn it the hard way. Like, just take my advice. Don't read the comments. Um, so, yeah, and they've, you know, I mean, they live with death threats and, you know, just really evil kinds of hate mail that comes my way. I was assaulted when I was publicly speaking. Um it's, it's really hard. Like, that's not supposed to be the way that we respond in a pluralistic democracy. We're supposed to have civic discussions. We're supposed to be able to talk to each other. That is how democracy works. And it's what the First Amendment is supposed to protect. And I just would hope that people would value that more than, you know, whatever ideology they've taken up. To understand that, that we're never going to move forward as a society if we can't just talk. And you don't have to agree with everybody. I mean, I always say, if you don't like my book, just take it back to the library. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm no interest in stopping you from doing whatever the thing is that you think is correct for nutrition. You'll see. I mean, I'm going to be right at the end of the day, but I I'm not going to, I can't have any, I don't want the power to physically stop you. I don't have the power. Like, why do you care? Just don't read my book if you don't like it. But that's not how it works. I mean, this is where it's, you know, this is more religion than anything else. And I am an apostate. You know, you're, if you're a heretic, you have to be burned at the stake. They have to get rid of your presence. So that's, I mean, I think a lot of where the hatred comes from. If I had given up the ground completely and said, I don't believe in this anymore. Um, I don't care. Animals are beneath us. They don't have souls. It doesn't matter. Eat whatever you want. They wouldn't care. But the point is, I'm, I'm still hanging. I'm still, we're battling for the same hill. You know, it's like, no, this is the more high ground. I'm not leaving it. I'm just telling you that there's more information out there that leads me to this conclusion, but I'm not giving up the fact that we, you know, need to have compassion for animals and we need to care about the planet and we need to care about each other. I'm not seeding that ground. And that's why they hate me. If it was just as simple as, Oh, I don't care about it anymore. Just go barbecue. They wouldn't care. Um, But they do. And that's why. So I, I need to be cleansed from the body politic, but you know, that's how it is. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. I mean, I knew that people were going to be upset, but I, I didn't know it would be as, as bad as it is. I would have done it anyway because I don't give in to bullies, but, you know, people, could we just take it down a notch or two? Like, I, there's no, what is served by sending people death threats because they don't agree with you about something? But it's not helping 
it's not helping our society at all to be that that polarized like it, and and also think for yourself like if 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 it's that threatening to have to engage with information that you don't agree with that's a problem like that's a fundamentalist mindset that's not how adults are supposed to negotiate the world like you're supposed to be able to talk to people that you don't agree with to engage with ideas that perhaps you you don't like like that's just what it means to be a citizen we're supposed to be able to have those discussions so there's something wrong with an ideology that seals you off that completely to which your only response is to send death and rape threats that's just not like we have to at least acknowledge that that's not right that's not a good way to behave in the world Yeah, and, and I certainly, you know, obviously, uh, it's tough to to see people get attacked that way. I mean, I, I you know, it's someone who promotes uh, eating animal foods, you know, and I, and I certainly have done my share of prom promotion of regenerative agriculture. And you know, we, didn't, in fact, tomorrow I have another regenerative agricultural specialist coming on. But uh, uh, Fred, uh, no, Glenn Alzinga from uh, Alder Spring Ranch out in Idaho, but. You know, one of the things, and, and because you spent 20 years sort of embracing this ideology, as you hear these arguments, and many of them are emotional, and you probably understand and were well-versed well in the vegan ideology about ethics and environment and so on and so forth. I think the health argument is easy to debunk, quite honestly, in my view. But when it comes to ethics, ethics is kind of very personal. The environmental stuff is depending on what metrics you use to frame the argument, I believe. But talk to me about, because a lot of, you know, I see a lot of this, I'm having my guilt-free vegan whatever, smoothie or salad. And, and when I say guilt-free, I'm just like, why, why are you deluding yourself? I mean, it's just like, if you participate in life as a human, you, there's going to be animal suffering and death. I mean, and you know, the, the, the thought is, well, I'm doing the least harm. And I, I don't even think that's true. I, I think that's, you know, I, you know, in my view, you know, when we look at it the way, you know, agriculture in, in general is delivered, you know, it's, it, whether it's tilled land or herbicides, pesticides, monocrop agriculture. And as you point out in your book, you know, even trying to raise an organic backyard garden and doing everything, you're still killing God knows how many creatures. You know, it's just depending where do you draw the line on sentience? Is it is it the cute little piglet and the, the duck or the little chicken? Or do we consider mice and other animals cute and cuddly and sentient as well? Or do we just disregard that stuff? So, so what, when, what, what do you, how do you counteract that argument that as a vegan, I'm doing the least harm? How, does, how, how do you counteract that, that, that argument? Yeah, so the problem is that none of us understand what agriculture is because we live in an agricultural society and it just seems like normal things that people do. And it's not. And this is a very recent activity, you know, on the scale of, you know, human existence on the planet. It's, you know, 99% of our time on the planet, we, we were hunter-gatherers. We're not agriculturalists. So this is really new. Um, and what is it? And that's the problem. Like, what is this activity? So you take a piece of land and in very blunt terms, you clear every living thing off it. And then you plant it just for humans. So all of those animals, like from you know the magnificent megafauna that we all feel such awe when we see, you know, like whether it's mountain lions or wolves or elephants, they're so fantastic, and we all love them. Like we can't not just thrill to their existence. All of them, all the way down to like tiny little creatures that you can only see with a microscope. Um, all of those creatures are removed from that piece of land. They have nowhere else to go. This is mass extinction because agriculture has taken everything it can take. There's no more land that it can, can, that it can grab. Okay, it's, it's devastated entire continents at this point. There's nothing left. Um, and all of that land, all of those creatures, it, it's just over. So 98% of the world's old growth forests and 99% of the world's prairies are gone. Okay, like let that sink in. Humans have taken all of it and we're growing what, just a tiny handful of things on it. So corn, rice, wheat, soy, and then, you know, some mostly pretty wretched chickens and pigs and, and some cows. That's pretty much what we've got going. So all of that life was removed. Um, yeah, so it's mass extinction. Uh, every day, 200 species go extinct. Every day, 200 species. It's because of agriculture. And this was 
that, you know, this was the information that I had such a terrible time grappling with when I was a vegan, because every historic thing that I read was like trying to figure out the origin of the problem. Why are we destroying the planet? Came back to this moment in history and I couldn't face it, but that is just the truth. And when I tried to do my own garden, I understood like, Oh, I have to clear the land. I get it. I have to actually destroy what is a little meadow. I have to, I have to get rid of the grass. And then what? Okay, now I'm going to be using this soil year by year, but I can see that the soil being exposed means it's going to die a little bit, you know, every day. Uh, it's eventually going to turn to desert if I do nothing better with it. So, um, and you're mining the soil. Every time that you plant an annual crop, you're mining. That's literally what they call it, mining the soil, because the plants are taking out the uh, minerals and they're not replacing them. So this is where you have to understand a couple of things that get complicated. You've got annual plants and perennial plants. And 95, something 95% 95 of uh, plants that are here are perennials. So nature absolutely prefers the perennials. The annuals have their place. But perennial plants, uh, they, have, they live a long time. That's why they're called perennials. They live more than one year. And they have a very deep root because of that. They have time to build pretty big bodies, really deep roots. Think about a tree. Uh, nobody could grow that big in a year, right? It could never be an animal. So, you know, the trees where I live are 2,000 years old. So that's a long time. Um, and they have very extensive roots because of that. And what that means is uh, a couple things. One is they hold the soil in place. Like they physically are the matrix that holds soil in there. Um, without them, of course, it just blows away. And go online and look at pictures of the Dust Bowl, South Dakota, North Dakota. They were farms that lost all of their topsoil in a single day because all of those grasses had been removed to do agriculture. And you can see these giant dust clouds that moved across the entire continent. They made it all the way into the Atlantic Ocean. That dust fell onto ships that were sailing halfway across the ocean. That's how much soil was lost in one single day from removing the, the protective root of the perennial plant. So they hold the soil in place. They protect the soil. They build soil. Um, and one of the ways they do that is they have their roots are deep enough that they can get down to the bedrock and they break it up. Um, they do that in conjunction with bacteria. So there's symbiotic relationships going on, but they can break up rock and they make minerals available. And those minerals are brought up to the rest of the living community. You and I cannot eat rock. We have no way to do that. Plants can do it. Plants and bacteria can do that. And they do it for us. They do it for all of us. So this is a community endeavor. Like every single time, no matter what you want to look at in nature, you're going to find that community where all these creatures are working together. It doesn't mean they're not killing each other because they are. That's a hard moment for vegans. They are killing each other, but it makes life stronger, right? So um, this is what agriculture has done. There's, there's no way to replace those minerals. Uh, there's no, no structure holding the soil in place. And it doesn't build soil. It destroys soil year by year. Every time the sun shines on it, the rain pounds it, the wind blows it away, it's just turning it to dust. And this is what's happened the world over. We've literally skimmed the planet alive. We've removed all of that topsoil. And by the year 1950, the planet was essentially out of topsoil. It was all gone. And what happened then, instead of, it should have been a collapse because that's the pattern of civilization. Um, civilizations last between 800 and maybe 2000 years until the soil gives out. Soil gives out, there's a collapse. There've been 34 civilizations. They all end in that collapse because their, their basis is this activity called agriculture, which is inherently destructive. And eventually you use up your soil, you have to conquer your neighbors, you use up their soil, you take their trees, their water, their fish, their everything, you bring it back into the power center that's the city in the middle of it. Um, eventually it's over for them too. And historically speaking, civilizations could only get so big uh, and then they would, they would have to collapse. Like there was no more territory to take. Um, and they were limited by a couple of things, which is sort of interesting to me. One is just distance. In the, in the era before we had the internal combustion engine and the only way to get military orders back and forth was on foot or by horse. Um, eventually that would just break, like it just was too long. And the other main thing of course is supply chain. You had to feed all those soldiers. So there was this constant back and forth, you know, getting raw goods back in and then back out to the soldiers. And it, it just, it can only get so big before it collapses. So Rome, for instance, the empire never could get over the Alps. So Northern Europe was pretty protected from that invasion because the Alps just sort of broke the supply chain. 
Um, and that's true everywhere you look at every civilization. They're only going to get so big and then then they collapse and there's no more neighbors to conquer. All the soil is gone. You know, the whole thing just, there's nothing but archaeological ruins now. And the last proteins in the cooking pots are human, which is to say people are starving. They eat people. It's always a grim process at the end. And 1950, that should have gone global because we had used up all the soil. And the reason it didn't was because of this thing called the Green Revolution. They had figured out thing called the Haber-Bosch process, how to make usable nitrogen out of oil and gas. And that's what we've been eating ever since, is oil and gas. Um, this is only putting the problem off another decade or two. Eventually, we're going to run out of oil and gas as well. It was never really going to be a solution. It's just temporary. And of course, it's one of the worst disasters that's ever befallen the planet. And it created this absolute mound there's just huge excess amounts of grain, corn especially, and, you know, the human population quadrupled in response. So it didn't solve the problem. It just made it four times worse because that collapse is inevitable. Well, this is the problem, right? It's an inherently destructive activity. It's based on overshoot and drawdown. Uh, underneath it, you're always going to end up with a militarized society because if you're dependent on taking your neighbor's stuff, they're not going to give it to you. You're going to have to conquer them. And that's why civilization are always agriculture at the bottom. Then you've got a layer of soldiers. We get the, you get the serfs and the slaves, and then you have the soldiers. And then there's this hierarchical sort of pyramid. It's going to be a king or you know a priest at the top of it. And they give the orders, and then they go out and they conquer, and they bring it back. And, you know, it's just, we weren't always living like this. Like, that's the thing. Like, we weren't. We don't have to, like, it doesn't matter what beautiful values you might hold in your heart. If you're living in a society that's based on overshoot and drawdown, you're going to need a military. It's going to be eventually about imperialism and genocide. And this is how agriculture wrecked human society as well. I mean, we didn't always live in this hierarchical pattern. Um, that's actually very new for us, and it doesn't do us any good. I don't think we were put here to kill each other. I think tremendous trauma happened through this process on every level of society. And that's what we've ended up with. So for people to try to say that this is somehow a diet that is based on justice and compassion and no death and, you know, kindness to the animals, we've wiped out 98% of animals' habitats. Like, how can you say this is good for animals? It's not. Like, where can they go? There's, like, there were elephants all the way across Asia and even into Europe. Like, they're gone. They're just gone. Like, you can't, ex agriculture can't exist with these giant megafauna because they need to eat so that's like that's the end of them people hunted them until they were gone because they got in the way of making food for humans very very different for hunter gatherers and hunter gatherers live with their neighbors they live inside their biotic community they take their nourishment from within them they don't impose themselves across it so you're destroying everything to do agriculture you're destroying the soil you're destroying all the plants and animals it's just all of it including the bacteria and the bacteria is really crucial. That's really, those are the creatures that are doing the basic cycle of life. They're, they're doing that really basic recycling um, that, again, you and I can't do. And without them, there's just, there's really no hope. So this is it. Like, this is how we destroyed the planet. And boom, it smacked right up against my vegan ideology. So it, you know, it's like you can use your ideology like a sledgehammer, but it, reality doesn't care. It, it's not going to bend. And this is what we've been doing to the planet. So, you know, like, there's not an easy way to say this to people. Like, it's a whole discussion. Do you understand the difference between annuals and perennials? Like, do you understand what we've done to the soil? And do you understand that this is going to have to be an expansive process every time because you're destroying it? And I had a professor when I was 19, and the college course I took that was called The Politics of World Hunger. And I thought I had all the answers because here I'd been a vegan for three years, and this is why people are hungry is because we're giving all this corn to whatever, to cattle and and he had this great sentence where he said you know the moment you put a plow to soil you degrade that soil and it was terrifying to me because first of all i was wrong and second of all i could see like if he's true this is just a series of dominoes that are continuing to fall until the planet's dead because we're going to have to keep taking more and more land but then we're going to destroy that land and then we're going to, have to take more and more land, but then we're going to destroy that land. And the planet only has so much surface area. 
it's one sphere. That's the end of it. And when it's all gone, what then? And that was what the class was about. So it wasn't enough to get me to stop being a vegan. I mean, I'll point out that I still clung to it. But uh, I did learn an awful lot that later I was able to kind of reabsorb that information. So anyway, no, there's nothing about this process of agriculture that is kind to animals, that's good to animals, that, you know, is going to help animals. It's literally just taking over their homes um, on a level that's mass extinction. And even if you want to put all that aside, which is a lot to put aside, uh, and just look at, okay, there's a cornfield. You know, every time that you harvest, you're killing probably a thousand animals per acre is what gets ground up. Uh, when you harvest. So that includes mice and snakes and ground dwelling birds. Um, and it's a really horrible process. I have never actually witnessed this, but I have friends that have who grew up on those kinds of farms. And they said, it's really awful because the last few acres that you harvest, all of the animals have run to hide there and you know what's inside that last acre. And all that's going to be left is like tiny little blood spattered corpses as you do that last little chunk because they've all run there. There's nowhere else for them to go. And that's it on a global scale. They have nowhere else to go. Um, but that's what's involved every time you harvest is all of those little creatures ground up. There aren't a lot of creatures that can survive in a cornfield or a wheat field. I mean, there should be way more biological diversity because it's a monocrop. Nature doesn't make monocrops. Um, but what what is there will get killed. So it's mostly small mammals, small birds, you know, some reptiles. And that's the end. And that's every single acre. And I, I you know, experienced this a tiny bit just being a home gardener because uh, lots of creatures want to eat that food that you're growing. And it was a constant source of trauma and also a constant, a constant battle, whether I was willing to fight it or not, to figure out how do I protect my lettuce? How do I protect my tomatoes? What am I going to do with all these creatures that want to eat this just like I want to eat it? And as a vegan, there's no good answer. As somebody who's more realistically approached the food chain now, I understand they do have to die to live. And that's a hard moment for vegans. No matter what you eat, very, very hard. But it is true. And for me now, like, the sooner that we can acknowledge that, the better off we are because we can make better choices about it. If we run from that knowledge, we'll never be able to make the right choices. But if we face that our lives are dependent on death, which they are, we can at least do those deaths in a respectful way and in a way that supports the cycle of life rather than destroying it. Yeah, it seems like, you know, even as, as we see many, you know, vegans are now, you know, they're getting educated. Some of this, you know, they realize that, hey, uh, my, my diet is killing a lot of animals regardless. And then they just say, well, you know, grains are being fed to cows anyway, and therefore I'm still doing less harm. They just kind of keep moving the goalposts it's like they don't really care what the facts are it's just like i'm gonna i'm gonna cling to my my ideology regardless now when you talk about the, like the npk fertilizer out the nitrogen phosphate potassium fertilizer you know is what we're eating now and you know it, it, the, the question is so megafauna depending on what you what you read and, and who you believe you know Somewhere 100,000 years ago, 60, 50,000 years ago is when kind of major these mass extinctions occurred. And it kind of coincided with human migration. You know, we see that across, you know, as, as the first Australians came in, you know, within 5,000 years, all the big megafauna happened. Pacific Islands, same thing, North America. And, and you, I'm sure you're aware, but North America had many, many, you know, uh, proscidians, elephants, mammoths, mastodons yeah. as well. I mean, we were, we, you know, we, we find these huge pits of yeah. elephant remains in Mexico now. So we, you know, this, the whole world was covered in megafauna and it was a, uh, you know, my view, it was a, a, a very easy place to, to, to acquire food. You know, you, and we didn't have many humans. We were, humans were, were numbered in the few millions to hundreds of thousands. And we had millions and millions and millions of these giant megafauna you know everywhere so it was a fairly easy type thing but you know today's obviously a different world i mean we can't go all back to hunting megafauna i mean it's just we can't become hunter gatherers so we have to figure out we have agriculture we have domestication of animals uh you know they're back breeding orcs in romania uh you know in 2025 supposedly the first orcs are going to read you know they've, they've been extinct since the 1500s but you know, you know, could you genetically bring back the mammoth? Maybe, maybe that's possible. But regardless, I, I just don't see us all hunting them as as a source of 
food for, for, for the majority of humans. So what do we do given the situation we're in? How do we walk ourselves back? What's the best solution for that? So I think that all of the land that is right now dedicated to annual crops uh, needs to be restored what it was. So we need to restore the prairies and we need to restore the forests as fast as we can. Um, and we need to learn to get our nutrition from within those communities once more. And I don't think this is that hard. Um, there were 60 million bison on this continent in 1491. Uh, we traded them in for 40 million pretty miserable cows. So it's not even like there's more food. There's actually less food. Um, and we could talk, I live in the Pacific Northwest, and I mean, we could talk about what's happened to the birds here, but the salmon were uncountable. There are still people alive who remember this because it wasn't that long ago. When they came back to spawn, you could hear them coming for a day. That's how many fish there were in the rivers. You could hear them for 24 hours before they arrived. Um, they said it sounded like it's like thunder in the distance, and that was the sound of the fish returning. They're all gone. Um, like there was so much food, and I, I don't even think we have to have that many fewer people. I mean, if we just did it correctly, you know, the fact that there were 60 million bison is like there's enough. Um, we just need to do it well. So there's lots of people out there who have figured this out and we can talk about Alan Savory and all the people, all the, you know, the acres and acres of land that's been restored using his insights. And it, it's amazing stuff. It's, they've done incredible things around the planet and there's no reason we couldn't do that here. Um, the part of the problem is that we are subsidizing the wrong foods entirely. And this is the farm bill every year in the United States where what they subsidize is those annual crops. And the farmers are essentially serfs. I mean, those poor people, the number one cause of death for farmers around the world, and it doesn't matter whether you live in the United States or India, number one cause of death is suicide. So they've been immiserated. I mean, their lives are, it's horrible, you know, what's happened to them. And that's because there's six corporations that control the world food supply, and they can command a price that's below the cost of production. So no matter how hard these people work, and they work really hard, um, they can't even earn a living. So then every year the farm bill steps in and provides a subsidy so that at least they can keep their heads above water until next year. But this is not a plan with the future. Um, most farmers who, who go to grass-based farming, even within the first year, can make a profit if they do it right. It's not hard to understand the principles. And in my experience anyway, and maybe this is self-selecting, but the people who go ahead and do that are so much happier. Like they can make an honest living and they love their land. It's usually been in their families for generations and they see that it's being degraded year by year. Like it's heartbreaking to them and they hate being dependent on the federal government. I mean, who wants to live like that? Like we all have our pride and our self-respect. So if you hand them the tools to do this, um, they'll do it. Like they're really excited about it and their farms are restored, you know, and either using bison or using beef cattle, either is fine. I don't even care at this point. Like, let's just get it done. Um, I, you know, emotionally, I'm more connected to bison, but I don't care. Like, either of these creatures can do it. You know, they can they can restore that prairie in, 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 into what it needs to be. So uh, let's do it. Like, we understand how it, how it happens now. There's enough demonstration sites around the world, and, and all we just need is, you know, a little help from the politicians would be good. Um, I mean, people are doing it anyway because um, – you know, just your self-preservation says, I need to earn a living. And when you see that your neighbors are able to do it, uh, it's, you know, it's useful. It's helpful. It's like you can ask questions and then it's a demonstration site right next to you. And it, it's, it's very, very moving stories about this, how people have kind of revived their lives and revived their farms and they're able to make a living now. So I don't even think it's that hard. I don't think it's that big of a leap. We just need kind of a different framework about it. And we do need to get those six corporations you know, sort of out. We need to, in whatever way, like they need to start controlling the world food supply because it's all about profit for them. It's not about helping small farmers. It's not about helping the land. It's not about delivering good nutrition. Um, and they're in control. So they, and they've got the foot of the federal government under their thumb. So there's a political battle to be fought for sure. Um, but, you know, for, for most individuals, they're not going to get involved in stuff that's that, that's that arcane. Um, really just find the local grass-fed farmers in your area buy from them as much as you can and tell your friends why this is the best way. That's really the best thing you can do to help people. And if you have young people in your life who want to get started, loan them money. And you know, if you've got a little bit of capital and somebody's doing that kind of a fundraiser, the best thing is to get young, young idealistic people who understand the problem onto the land and start doing this. 
there's really there's such good information now. It's not the same as it was 30 years ago when none of us understood this. Like we can see how fast it happens. The, the, the ground is restored and that carbon is sequestered. There's so many problems we can solve with this. You know, rural poverty, global warming, you know, human health. Like it's it's like what I thought I was doing as a vegan. Actually, you can do that by by buying grass fed beef. Oh. So, yeah, and I think you know the the one issue I, I would say is you know the problem like if you go to the grocery store and buy grass fed beef, the labeling laws have changed. So it's you don't really know what you're getting. So you really, I mean, I think the local really getting in touch with who's growing it and how it's being raised is going to get you what you think you're actually paying for. And you know, one of the things that you know, so the the, the pro plant based people, and particularly the companies that are trying to get this faux meat out there beyond me and impossible burger and some of the other <laughs> companies are pointing to this, you know, some of the IPC, uh, IPCC data, uh, looking at studies from several years ago, making assumptions about grass fed beef. And we're seeing with, like you mentioned, Alan Savory and uh, Will, Will Harris and, and Alan Savory and, or, or uh, uh, Joel Salatin and, you know, Ray Archuleta and Gabe Brown and, uh, and, and after and after and, after, and, I, and you know, Alan Williams and, you know, I, and I've interviewed most of these guys. They are, you know, on the ground making it happen. They're sequestering soil. They're upping their productivity levels. They're able to actually manage more animals on the same amount of ground. Their, their productivity goes up. They are doing it without pesticides, without herbicides. They're not doing that by kill or, or whatever you want to call it. They're not seeing the soil run off. They're sequestering water they are actually doing it, you know, at scale. And I think this is something that, you know, like you pointed out 20 years ago, people weren't as good at doing it, but now we have 20 years of data, you know, showing that, you know, or, or, or learning and this knowledge is spreading. And the other thing that you, that you mentioned was these people are happier. These people have come out from underneath the government's thumb, come out from underneath the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the huge inputs, the, the, the big combines, the big, you know, fertilizer buys, the big pesticide buys, you know, and, and you know, the loans they have to take out, the yeah. millions of dollars of debt they accrue. And now they're starting to dig their way out from that. And then they, you know, they enjoy what they do. And you yeah. don't have the suicide rate, which is important. But, uh, um, Leah, this has been wonderful. Unfortunately, I have to run and do a consultation sure. right now. But can you please tell us, where to find out more information about how to find you, uh, how to access your book, if you have a website, social media, so if you, people can kind of dig more into this stuff. And I certainly appreciate the work you've done over the years. You've been obviously a pioneer in this. And, 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 and you know, it's a tough road to, you know, it's a, it's a tough road to, to travel. I mean, you know, you get, you, <laughs> there's a lot of headwinds. Uh, I see it every day too, but I mean, it's, you know, like I said, it's something that needs to be done. Um, yeah, so, the easiest way to find me is um, my website, learkeith.com. But I say that as a joke because I have a strange name and nobody knows how to spell it. Actually, the easiest way to find me is just type into Google vegetarian myth because that's there's one book called that and I wrote it. So if you type in vegetarian myth, you will find my website. And if, if you're good at remembering things, it's learkeith.com, L-I-E-R-R-E -R -R -E is my name. But vegetarian myth will get you there. And my website, my books, and, and all that is there. Um, yeah, that's probably the easiest way. You can try to friend, friend me on Facebook too, but um, I I don't always look at the friend requests. So it's, there's just so many. I, it's overwhelming. But anyway, the website is definitely the easiest way, but I'm fairly accessible to the public. And my email address is there if you want to write me questions. I'm, I always try to respond to people as fast as I can. So yeah, I, I'm assuming that you're your audience probably doesn't have too many questions. I'm sure this is all kind of old school to them, but um, yeah, that's how you find me. And are you, I know with coronavirus, I know, I know my, my speaking schedule got just totally just made non-existent this year because I had, I was supposed to have like six or seven international trips where I was going to speak this year and it, you know, big zero at this point. Are you, do you still do much of that? Is that something you do? Do you go out and speak much anymore or I'm not sure? <laughs> well, I've been sort of permanent. I've been, yeah, I've been permanently canceled by the woke. So uh, I rarely do speaking engagements anymore. And it, it's just, it is what it is. Like the culture's kind of gone down the tube. So I'm always happy to go speak. Um, 
I think one last holdout is kind of the you know, sort of paleo people. They don't really care about the woke thing so much. So I still do get some of those invites. But a lot of the other speaking that I did is just over. It's anytime I turn up, there's, I, I'll just get canceled right away. It's like nothing but death threats and rape threats and arson threats. And it's like, it's just not worth it. So all the organizers pull out as fast as they can. And I'm a little tired of it. Like, really? I mean, who's going to be left to talk to if I'm not a bad person? I'm not, not saying we, like me, really? But no, there it is. So, um, yeah. And I was going to be speaking in England in uh, last March, April, but of course, coronavirus killed that one too. I was really looking forward to going, but oh well, we'll see what happens. But I'm always happy to do a speaking engagement if anybody, anybody out there wants to bring me, I'm happy to come. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think maybe hopefully the tide's turning a little bit. So hopefully we'll, we'll see it around. But anyway, thank you so much for doing this. It's been wonderful. I know everybody is going to enjoy it. And when we release Good. it as a podcast, I think it'll hopefully, you know, I'm sure it'll be well received. So anyway, um, well, you're welcome in this community anytime, Lear. Okay. And uh, thank, thank you, you so much. Maybe we, maybe we, I feel like there's more we could talk. Maybe we could do a follow-up round two down the road sure. a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. It's been fun. All right. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay, everybody, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. We got Glenn Elzinga, Elder Spring Ranch, another regenerative farmer we're going to talk to. So we'll hopefully see everybody back tomorrow. Okay, thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.